Okay, this brings us to our theme number three, the transformative decadal plan, which is how we put this all together so we can pitch this to the congressman walking to his vote. And uh, also other investors, because uh, as we said before, the private industry is in some ways leading the way to space now. So how, what can we show them? How can we guide them? Yep. So hi, everybody. Um, I have the honor of introducing this theme. And in general, what my goal here is, is to just level set everybody about what the problems are, some of the ways that we can address them when it comes time to get ideas out of the lab and into reality. And so the title of this talk is Making Big Ideas a Reality. And hopefully by the end, we'll, we'll walk away with two things. One is the sort of language and framework to think about what it's like to do technology transfer. And the second is I'll give a brief introduction about one way that I personally am trying to help one of a myriad of different ways that one can approach it. Um, so to start off with, I think TRL is a really nice framework for thinking about the problem that we're addressing here. So TRL 1 to 4 is pretty well covered by governments and universities at this point. So this is basic science research and sort of getting to the point where you can build a prototype that shows that a concept works in general. And it's handled relatively well by nonprofit entities under governments and universities. After you get to that point, it starts trailing off. And the problem is that you end up with this case where, OK, you have a, a POC of some sort. Now you need to figure out a way to actually get that to market. And what that takes is what's referred to on the business side of things as product market fit. Turns out this is really hard to do. It's a hard, in any case, it's even hard in software where there's almost no capital expenditure required. And it's exponentially harder when every time you do an iteration, it costs you $100 million. So it's a really hard problem. And because of that, it's gained this infamous title, uh, the Valley of Death. So after you get past the product market fit stage, the private sector picks it up pretty well after that, figures out a way to scale it up, make money out of it. Uh, but that bridge between four and seven is really where a lot of the problems lie. And so I think a good way to sort of crystallize the problem that we're going after with this theme in general is how do we get across the valley of death? So, so the first question, I think, is why do it? Like, we need to figure out why we want to expend this energy in the first place to, to do technology transfer broadly, not only in this domain, but just really in any one of them. And one way to think about this is that almost everything that has really changed the, the course of humanity has come through this process. It's gone from an idea in a lab all the way out to market at scale. And all of these are examples that actually all came from just one lab, which is Bell Labs. And a good, this is a, a typical example of an organization that managed to get tech transfer right, but there's a huge but there. And it's something that we don't have access to, which is they had a monopoly to give them several hundred million dollars a year to do their work. We don't have that option, but we have others available to us. And so what I'm going to go through now is really why it's worth it to do that still, even with the resources that we have. And so it turns out that there have been many studies at this point showing a stable result of 20 to 60 percent annual return on investment for basic science research dollars. So if you put a dollar in the TRL1 project, how much that gains over the next six years is the typical horizon for these studies is between 20 and 60 percent annual return on investment. This is way outperforming the market, and it's such a stable number that it's wonderful also for bridging gaps between when, for example, there's an economic downturn. This is stable throughout. So this was stable across the 2008 crisis. It was stable in all of the different recessions that we had. And so it's actually a very good investment instrument for cases where you don't care about the sort of next year returns. Turns out venture capital is a very good match for this, which is part of the reason why venture capital has been starting to fund space, but I'll get into that shortly. So from a financial standpoint, it's a really good investment. And so from the business side, there's actually a lot of incentive to try to drive toward basic science research. There are other problems, though, that keep corporations and whatnot from contributing, which we'll also get to shortly. So why is it so hard? There's sort of, there are a lot of reasons why it's hard, actually. But we'll focus on three, because those are the sort of addressable ones that we can deal with in, uh, in a symposium like this, which people, seed capital, and the organizational incentives are the real problems to focus on. People is not necessarily the, the, top, the top of everybody's list if you just went and told people about it, but I would say it's the most fundamental thing to get right. 
So if you want to bring an idea to market, you need a lot of different skills. So technical is the one that we're all the most familiar with here. That is typically what you start off with. So you have a better mousetrap. Now you need to get it out the door to somebody. You have the person who built the mousetrap, but you don't necessarily know the right person to sell it to, how they're going to buy it. You don't know necessarily where to get the money to scale up, to scale up manufacturing for it. So you need a lot of different things. Um, sort of the, the order of operations, the first thing you need is obviously technical expertise. You've got to have something to, to transfer in the first place. The second is then business. And business is there, you bring the, that skill set in for one reason, and that's to find product market fit. If you find that, then you can get marketing people, salespeople, product management, and HR on board, but all of those things have to be humming sort of seamlessly before anything is going to work. And so you need to make sure that you get all of those people involved. And sometimes people will have more than one of these skills, but no matter what, you have to have each of those skills in your project or it will not be successful. Um, and early on, the, the resources are scarce, so what you're looking for is a nice source of people who have more than one of these skills because you're not going to be able to hire a full-time HR person on day one. So it's really important for you to build a network of people who have at least one or two of these skills so that you can call on them on at least a sort of part-time fashion. And also, a problem with people is that entrepreneurship broadly, which this this only addresses about, about two-thirds of the way that you can transfer technology would fall under the umbrella of entrepreneurship. You can also grow it within the government, which I'll also uh, go into detail with here shortly. But entrepreneurship specifically, if you're going that route, is really high risk. So the problem is if you bring, if a professor, for example, came up with the technology, it's really hard to convince them to leave their university and go start a startup. Now, startups are high risk. If you spent your whole career getting tenure, you're not just going to walk away from that, and that's logical. So that, but that's a really key problem that you have to be aware of up front and find out a way to get around it. And also, a sad fact of life, many people just can't afford entrepreneurship. It's a, it starts off very poor and can grow into almost anything, but you start off poor, and if you don't have enough savings, a lot of people just can't go into it in the first place. And now this is what I'll spend quite a bit of time on, because it's really important, I think, just to, to get everybody on board with the um, sort of ways that you can raise capital for it. So I talked about people, but seed capital is really, I think, what comes first to mind with people uh, when, when it comes time to actually try to get something to market. And these are, there are a myriad ways of getting finance. I sort of broke it down into these eight because it's sort of bite-sized chunks. Of course, there are exceptions to all of this, but this is a general guide for how you can think about raising capital for tech transfer. The first and actually my favorite in almost all scenarios is angel investors. Uh, their sweet spot, they write checks typically between 25K and 500K. It can go way above that sometimes, typically not. I mean, like SpaceX, Blue Origin are examples of that going way above that. but. Um, at, on average, it'll be between 25, 25K and 500K. The good news, though, is that you can raise that from multiple ones. So like for my company, we raised about 300K from three different angels. And you can do that pretty quickly. Like I think I spent probably a total of five hours doing that. It's relatively simple. Um, you need to have a really strong pitch and everything, which I can help you with after this talk if you need it. But basically, angel investors are great because the incentives are aligned. It's their own money. So they, are, they really care about it being a viable business or something that they care about seeing a, a change in the world, basically. And so you have two methods to play instead of most of these, which are financially driven. Um, second is venture capital. And I want to take a little... A few minutes to describe venture capital because it is one of the more illogical industries out there and so it's really good to just sort of level set about what their incentives are and what they're trying to solve when they give you money. Now the sweet spot for seed for venture capital is between 300k and a million. As I mentioned less than 300k they're probably not interested because of the time constraints and it's better to just invest so you actually don't want to come and say hey look I can do this for really cheap. You want to say, hey, I want you know, $500,000 from you, or I'm raising $2 million. And really, you should go talk, find somebody. Like, I'm more than happy to help with this, but find somebody who you can talk to to figure out what the market is right now for seed sizes, because everybody is going to be expecting that. And if you ask for too little, they're going to think you either, A, don't know what you're doing, or B, you just don't understand what you're doing, and you actually need more capital. And whether that's true or not, that's what they're going to walk away with, and they just won't invest in you. So it's really important for VC that you go ask somebody what the market is at the moment. Um, another thing about venture capital is that you really probably need revenue, even at seed nowadays. With pre-seed, you can get by without it, but um, for sort of meaningful size capital, you're going to need revenue most likely. 
Um, so that's another sort of constraint. Um, and then there's government grants. And actually here, you guys all have a much better idea about it than I do, but I did spend some time doing this. Um, the sweet spot for that is sort of between 150K and 2 million, unless you're part of a big government program, which can really go almost anywhere. Um, it's interesting that it's hard to get one of these grants if you have revenue already, because the point is that they're trying to get you to commercialization. So it's converse to angel investors and venture capital that typically don't want revenue because they see that as a functioning business. So if you have it, it can be a little harder to get that particular piece. And also, the stage is sort of anything less than TRL5. Um, then there's government-managed R&D programs, as I mentioned briefly before. Those can be huge. There's almost no upper limit. And I think a lot of the stuff we're talking about here would fit squarely within those categories. Um, it's uh, one of the places where you can get really high-risk capital um, for rather large sums of money. Like, there's almost nothing on the private market that will give you that. So a lot of things will just have to fit within that. Loans are almost useless in this discussion for almost all cases. Um, banks will never give you a loan for anything unless you already have revenue and they, you can have collateral and all that sort of stuff. So as appealing as that may sound, it's not even worth your time thinking about. Private equity is more nowadays for buyouts and things like that, so you really need to have a solid business before you can go after them, despite the fact they can write very large checks. There are some ways that you can do that if you can show that you have a path to profitability or you're gaining a whole bunch of IP that you can resell later or something like that, but for the most part, private equity is sort of out for tech transfer purposes. Corporate labs are an interesting situation. So they are... It depends a lot on what the corporation is. There's, they're all over the map. So there's Google X that has billions of dollars that they can throw around. But they haven't shown historically in recent times to be super successful for doing large amounts of tech transfer with a few notable exceptions. And the problem is that they usually are start, like Google X starts off with these really long-term visions that are kind of like nobody really knows how to work toward them and it's unclear how that fits in their business model. And so it's, they've sort of been underperforming recently, but historically I think that they've been really active and helpful. So uh, I think the best examples currently are kind of SRI. So SRI is more, they're not exactly a corporate lab, but they are a nonprofit lab that's done spinoffs and I think is worth mentioning because their model has worked really well. They came up with Siri, Intuitive Surgical, all this sort of stuff, using grant funding and dealing with the tech transfer to make spin-off companies, uh, which I think is a really promising direction and is actually the thing I'm working on, which I'll get to shortly. Um, but in general, corporate labs are kind of all over the place, but also I think my biggest problem with them is that if I'm a scientist with an idea, if you go to a corporate lab, you have to completely give it up and give them full control over it, and you'll see almost none of the upside. So I find that to be a very unfortunate side effect, which kind of disincentivizes people from going that direction. Conversely, though, if you can manage to sell your idea to Google X, you'll have funding for it forever. So that's actually a good option if you don't mind giving up the upside. I just think it's unfortunate that you basically have to do that. And then there's philanthropy, which the sweet spot for that is actually pretty wide-ranging. It's sort of 10K to 5 million. Um, there's... It, this is 100% situation specific, and if you don't have a network for it, it's kind of not worth thinking about either because it's really hard to get those grants because they're highly competitive, and you'll, they're typically very specific. So if you have something that matches really well malaria or will solve malaria, then the Gates Foundation is great for you. But if you don't, then there are a few things. So you just have to be really targeted with the stuff that you're doing there. But I would never give up on it because people who have really passion, a passion about a specific domain are rather likely to, to fund you if that comes to it. So that's a really good option if you have something and you can find a good match for it. So that's seed capital. And now my, my favorite topic actually is really is organizational incentives. So one of the problems that exists right now is that the existing organizations just aren't set up right for tech transfer broadly. Uh, the, the, the incentives just aren't there. So for the most part, um, on the academic side, the professors and government lab researchers are mostly incentivized to publish, which is a good thing, and I think a great thing for the ecosystem, and we shouldn't get rid of that, but also acknowledging the fact that that's the main reason that they're incentivized to do their work is an important one because it explains why a lot of things end up just languishing in universities and not going anywhere, even if they're revolutionary ideas. 
because the originators of these ideas, whether it's the professors or the folks in the lab that are working there, they're almost always on an academic track. And where they end up is not spinning off companies or anything like that. Their ideal is to become a professor. And you don't really get any brownie points for spinning off companies. And in fact, it would greatly disrupt your career to do so. So universities and sort of nonprofit labs are not necessarily incentivized to do that because there's no real upside for the people who would be transitioning the technology. And in a lot of cases also, the way that the technology transfer offices will work, they'll have either a capped amount or such a small amount that it's not really worth their time to do the transfer. So you'll get like 50K or something, but that's nothing compared to the upside of what a lot of these technologies can generate. Um, and on the private side, it's really hard to motivate people to allocate large amounts of capital for something that has a time horizon of 10 or more years. It's, it doesn't mesh really well with the way that the financial market works right now. And so what they want to see is a proof of concept that they could bring to market more or less now with a few tweaks. And so you can kind of think of it as a company will buy your licensing if they can bring it to market within a year. If it's going to take more than that, they're not going to invest in it. And you're not going to be able to get a very good deal for it. Some of them will buy licenses anyway, but you're going to get very little money. And they're just sort of going to table it. And they're doing that more as a protective measure than they are as a sort of real R&D uh, investment. And VCs and angels rarely invest. So angels rarely invest at that stage because they don't it's their own money, so they don't want something that's super risky, and they just the, the risk reward there. They, they may invest in it if they're really passionate about it and have a lot of money, but for the most part, they're just not gonna not gonna do it because it's their own money, and you don't want to just throw your money in in a trash or or something that's super high risk to them. And VCs don't do it because they need returns within the ten year time horizon so they can show performance of their fund. So they're just not going to not going to do it if it takes longer than that. Um, and also the employees, so uh, one of the, like what I was talking about before, one of the frustrating things about corporate research labs is that the people who invent the ideas very rarely share in the upside in any significant way, which I think is kind of unfortunate because it doesn't incentivize people to be creative, it just incentivizes them to do the work they're asked to do. Um, so there are four main ways that we do it today, and each of them have their own sort of problems that, uh, map to that uh, discussion we just had about the organizational structures. Um, there are government labs, corporate research, universities, and independent research institutes. Um, each of them have problems. And first off, I'm, I'm focusing on the problems here because that's the stuff we're trying to solve. All these institutions do wonderful jobs of this every single day. So this is not me trash talking them at all. I think all of them do really important work and there's nothing wrong with them at all at the, at the high level. But specifically for what we're trying to do here, Understanding the barriers is an important thing so that we can figure out how to work around them. So government labs, research skills are not, do not equate to grant writing skills. This is a really interesting, weird incentive structure that these have set up where if you, the, the terminus of a particular career path inside of a government lab ends up having you in an administrative position typically writing grants, which is interesting because what the, the, the problem with that is that ideally, and in almost every other industry, the more that you work in that field, the better you get, the higher up you go, but the fundamental tenets of what you're working on don't necessarily change. And also the fundamental tenets of your direct reports don't change as time goes along until you get into the sort of C-suite is really the only time that that happens in, in other industries. Whereas in government labs, and also this is the same story as you'll see the same bullet point for universities is exactly the same argument. You, and the higher up the ladder you go, the less of the original work that got you there is relevant. So you just, uh, there's a really interesting, several studies actually about professors' times at universities, and they basically spend about 8% of their time doing research at that point. The rest of it is grant writing, administration, and teaching. So there's this weird structure set up where the, the system rewards people who can do grant writing, not necessarily the people who are the best at research. There are definitely people who do both, and do both really well. But the, the system is set up in a way that's counterproductive to what we're trying to go after here. Um, and also, there's no infrastructure at government labs, almost at all, for capturing the value that's created. Um, and in fact, the government is typically explicitly permitted to, or not forbidden, for capturing the data back, or capturing the, the value back. Um, and the researchers are not incentive to commercialize because of that. And corporate research, I already talked about before, it's just uh, near-term profits are, are much better than long-term profits, and that's kind of always how it'll be. 
And independent research labs have a lot of the problems that the government labs and the universities have. They're also additionally typically underfunded um, and nonprofit with little mechanism for capturing the value they create. And also there's just not enough of them. Um, so at this point in history, there's a big hole where Bell Labs used to sit where private funding and basic research, there's almost no way to do it in the current uh, way things are set up. Um, and what, so really what we're trying to do here is find a way to bridge this gap uh, that we discussed before, the valley of death. And this is uh, a problem that I'm working on with a group of folks from Stanford actually, um, to try to set up a new organization where this, all these incentives are aligned and you can just bridge the gap between TRL 4 to 7 basically. Um, and I already sort of discussed most of this before and I, I don't want to take too much of your time so I won't spend too much time but please come ask me about this afterwards because I'm really excited about it. Um, the, the core problems that we're trying to solve is that we want to give scientists a good career path that doesn't require them to go into administration that lets them continue their research while also rewarding the ideas that they come up with ensuring that they can own the upside for anything that happens for the work that they do. Um, and the things that the, the labs are offering is uh, intellectual freedom, so we have a mechanism to ensure that everybody can work on problems that they want to work on um, at any point. And there's no, there, it's, there, it's explicitly forbidden that there's sort of top-down directives for how people work. We direct, we, the way we direct the course of the institution is through folks we hire to sort of facilitate things, which I can go into detail with each of you individually afterwards if you're interested. Um, but also it deals with things like IP protection, so making sure that patents are there when it makes sense to do and provides resources as well. So lab equipment, funding, uh, grant writers, things like that. And also venture capital, so we have a partner that can uh, do venture capital funding. Um, so anyway, if, uh, if you're interested in any of that, please reach out. This is an email that will get to us and the team. Um, and in general, I just uh, am really looking forward to hearing more about how we can transfer this technology specifically. And for that, I will hand it over to Dr. Early with the decadal plan for what we've talked about. Thank you all.